Etrian Odyssey 3 The Drowned City has an almost undisputed status among the fanbase as an all-time great, a masterpiece in design and story, fun combat, class energy, and obviously, the best soundtrack. While all of the above is debatable, I still have a great fondness towards this game that exudes fun and wanted to give a little introspective as to what exactly draws me towards it. A mini review, if you will. In a Famitsu interview in 2009, Etrian series director Komari Shigeo said he felt really attracted by the warm southern sea as an idea for the third game, and boy did he go all out. Etrian Odyssey 3 by far puts most of its development skill points into the atmosphere, world building, and story. That's not to say that previous entries in the trilogy don't do a good job. In fact, my favorite would be Etrian Odyssey 2's Tolkien-esque adventure of climbing up to the heavens. It's just that Etrian Odyssey 3 drowns you in its aesthetic. From the very moment you enter Armorode, you are thrust into a world of sea and sunshine, a port city clad in marble. I could almost feel the sea breeze in the heat of summer just by looking at the lively backgrounds, blinding like piercing doorways, the ever blue skies as far as the eye could see, and coupled with the optimistic music, this brought back childhood memories of many Mediterranean coastal towns. You then proceed to the labyrinth entrance on a path filled with flowered covered arches, like a beach resort of some sort, and as you venture in, you are treated to a flowered filled paradise, waterfalls and wildlife, a tropical experience right beside the beach, complete with a unique animation. What sells this environment is the effort put into making it feel more alive and dynamic. For one, the engine was upgraded to add even more 3D objects, with animated water, lava, glowing effects, bubbles, trees, and even location-aware sound effects from the environment, such as running water. Coupled with the capability to see beyond what's accessible, first introduced in EO2, it makes the labyrinth seem so open, rather than just a forest maze. There's also a difference in core labyrinth design, with more fleshed-out movement puzzles, FOE puzzles, floor puzzles, and even entire areas of the map accessible in the later game, adding a whole new dimension to the floors you've already explored. But that's not all, as the labyrinth design is now more influenced by the story, the game's main selling point for a lot of the fanbase and what I'm deeply fond of. Instead of always descending, the labyrinth splits into sections, specifically designed for story events, giving a sense of meaning to your environment, aside from it's just a gameplay area, and a general sense of urgency presented by the story and amplified by dialogue makes solving puzzles or navigating correctly that much more important. All the while, you'll be constantly encountering main characters in and out the labyrinth, befriending them, learning about their ideals and motivations, which will only make it harder to choose. You see, EO3 is the first and only game in a franchise with different story endings, and they require you to choose a side, presenting quite the moral and personal conundrum. But it also makes the stakes that much more important. Alongside the story, what makes people jump with excitement at this game is the music, and it's easy to tell why. It's fun, it's flashy, it makes you feel like a shonen protagonist having their first exciting battle, the music having a defiant tone with a dose of optimism. Even the FOE battle team doesn't make you feel as uneasy as the previous ones. Rather, it makes you say, bring it on, big guy. It's as if the fear is secondary and you want to test out your strength, backed by this awesome soundtrack. Legendary composer Koshiro Yuzo took advantage of every channel the PC-98 would give him for layered and interesting themes that complete the aesthetic of this game. And eo 3 soundtrack was a definite source of inspiration given the sheer amount of Dojin albums and the outstanding Super Range album. Etrian Odyssey 3 also includes a lot of quality of life improvements and adjustments which make the game more accessible low better and generally more fun. Mapping tools now have more diverse colors and different icons for gathering spots. 
There's also a new auto walk function, allowing you to move to specific areas like gathering spots or pass the time without manual inputs. Just build your path and go. The most major addition is the ability to subclass your character, allowing you to spend skill points to get skills for that additional class, adding so much versatility to your team. The skill upgrade menu was also adjusted with subclass and common skills sectioned off from your main ones while keeping the more transparent UI from EO2. The addition of forging lets you add additional bonuses into weapons, increasing their stats, attack power, or adding bind or status ailments. And while a floor was taken out of every stratum, this was supplemented with a whole other section to explore in the form of sea quests, giving you another way to farm items, fight even more bosses, and meet other NPCs. It's not all sunshine and roses though. While subclassing gives you a lot of options, some combinations just don't make any sense, no matter the party. For example, Zodiacs are ridiculously overpowered early on, but eventually their elemental skills become less effective, forcing you to spec into the physical attack Meteor. But if you do that, it only makes sense to subclass into a Gladiator for the skill Charge. For anything else, Zodiacs are forced into a support role, usually serving to negate TP cost. Likewise, early game Buccaneers have useful bind skills, but it quickly becomes obvious that a gun-wielding build isn't viable, its elemental chase skills also being more and more useless as elemental attacks become used less and less. Not to mention farmers, for only good as glorified cargo containers, harvestry and safe stroll galore, and some builds are simply too useful to pass by on. Monk subclass as prince says anyone? Having all the buffs and heals in one? Yeah, you probably have one. Everyone does. The sea exploration also feels a bit too limited. You are restricted in your movements with a turn-based system, and a simple mistake can reset all your progress that day. It's more of a mini-game than a dungeon side content that's a bit too disconnected from the rest of the gameplay. Still, these flaws don't invalidate set additional content, and with so much of it. Various class combinations, different story endings, various labyrinth puzzles, and new areas, sea exploration, Etrian Odyssey 3 has an insane replay value. And with the quality of life improvements, it's far easier to get into than its predecessors. It's a great place to start without skipping out on the challenge. At least, most of the challenge. There's one final criticism one can levy. Does all this detract from what Etrian was supposed to be? A homage to 80s dungeon crawlers like Wizardry? I would have to say no. Etrian was never supposed to be a clone of those games. Better a modern reimagining, taking some of the design cues, but adding what wasn't technically possible with the computational power of the time. And while EO3 moves away from the almost pure gameplay of the original, it's still as dungeon crawlery as ever. Just a bit more exotic, colorful, fun. Color fun! That's the word to describe it. The best in the series? Definitely a contender.